Uh, it is my pleasure to present Hector Garcia, Doctor of Psychology, uh, who is the author of Alpha God, The Psychology of Religious Violence and, and Oppression. Dr. Garcia is a professor of psychiatry at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. Thank you so much for having me here today. It's good to be back in New York. I lived in Brooklyn for a couple of years, went to Rutgers, and so it's good to be back. Thanks to David Orenstein for making the, the connections and for coming through with this lovely presentation here. There was a little scare that we wouldn't have a PowerPoint and he just came through immediately. He says, I'll go, I'll go out and buy something. I'll set it up. Don't worry about this man is mission ready. Thank you for that, David. Appreciate it. Um, so I want to ask you, what comes to mind when we think of religious violence and oppression? 9-11, I'm sure everybody this, that, who lives here, that, that's the first thing that comes to mind. I just spent the afternoon at the memorial. It was so moving, nearly brought me to tears. It was just stunning. What else comes to mind? The Inquisition. The Inquisition. I was just about to go there. Yes, the history buffs in the audience may think of the Inquisition or the Thirty Years' War or the Crusades, or the conquest of the Americas. ISIS, Boko Haram, the, the, mass, the beheadings, the immolations, the women not being able to vote or drive. There's no shortage of, of contemporary or historical examples. So as, as an unbeliever, I have a deep appreciation for how high the costs of religious violence and oppression really are. Because I can say, with near total certitude that those who get killed by religious violence come to an existential end. And they don't get a second chance in some better place. I can say with the same high degree of certainty that those who suffer religious oppression and all the ways that the powerful can enact that suffering, they don't get their misfortunes rearranged in some other, some other place and time. So this realization for me amplifies the moral urgency to understand these phenomena and to use the best tools at our disposal to do so and to be fiercely honest about what we find, even though that may generate a degree of discomfort in, in what we find about ourselves. And, and before we get into the, the, the explanations to where this all comes from, I just want to say I'm pretty new to the free thinking, secular humanist, atheist movement. I didn't really know much about it, frankly, until after I wrote this book and people started approaching me for you know, podcasts and radio interviews and stuff like that. But, but I, I got to tell you, I've been really impressed with what I've seen so far. And one of the things that impresses me is there seems to be such a, a, a current of fearlessness that runs through this community. Because you're t uh, what I've seen is people you know, being willing to look at our own mortality and not flinch. People who are be willing to, to stand alone because of, their, because of how they think and because they're forced to stand alone in many cases. For people who are willing to challenge their own thinking and their own assumptions and change their thinking if, if, if it doesn't stand up to, to, to reason or to science. And that takes a lot of courage. I've also heard some amazing stories um, of deconversion for some people, uh, it's coming out as LGBT to their parents and, and being told they're going to hell and being told they're, they gotta, they got to they gotta move out or being disowned. I've heard some people just following, following their, their intellect and saying, hey, you know, some of these things don't really make sense, you know, like virgin births, et cetera, et cetera, you know. I recommend David Ornstein's book about the ethnography of, of, of that whole process of, of becoming a secular thinker. I, I've also heard um, people talk about um, suffering terrible sexual, physical, emotional traumas at the hands of religious leaders. And through all these stories, I've often been asked, you know, what is, what is your story? How did, you, how did you become to not be a believer? And how did you, however did you come to write this book, these ideas, where did they come from? So I, I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about that story, and so far as it might be, you know, meaningful to, to, to people. Uh, in my case, I, I, I wasn't deconverted, as it were. I, I was always grew up as a non-believer. My, my dad was was an atheist. 
um, which was, and a, and a neo-Darwinist, which was a very difficult thing to do uh, on the border town where I came up in El Paso, where information barely trickled in, especially during the Depression age, um, where my, when my dad, you know, was coming up in life. Um, his story is a little bit more interesting. His, he, his, his parents were just very brutal and they, they, they subjected him to terrible physical and emotional abuse and all the while screaming hellfire and damnation and sin and all this kind of stuff while they were doing it. So that cauterized in him any love for religion that he may have and I was brought up, I was brought up secular. Um, how, I've also been asked how did I come up with, with this idea of alpha god and it really made me think because it had been simmering for so long I hadn't really thought about it. And one of the things that I come up with is, is time and time again is where I grew up and how I grew up. So I grew up in El Paso, Texas. It's a southwestern desert town. Yeah, we got one person who knows that. Fort Bliss, Army. That's it. <laughs> yeah, this is usually it. Um, so uh, on the Mexico, New Mexico, Mexico border. I come from a giant Mexican-American family. I don't even know how many cousins I have, but you know, almost every single one of them is Catholic. Some are born again. And ethnically, I'm what's known as mestizo. And what that means is a mix of native and Spanish heritage. Both sides of my family, they came to the US uh, during the Mexican Revolution to escape that in the early 1900s. And the, the native side came from a group of people um, known as the Raramuri. And here's a picture of one of these guys. The, the Spanish mistakenly called this tribe the Tarahumara, but their real name is the Raramuri, which means the running people. Pretty obscure tribe until recently when Christopher McDougall wrote, uh, wrote his bestseller called Born to Run, where he talks about these guys' running ability. They run these 100-mile races, 200-mile races, 400-mile races, wearing sandals, hours ahead of anybody else smoking tobacco <laughs> while they're doing it. These guys are amazing. I've, I've since tried to replicate some of this and I've gotten as far as 50 miles wearing sandals. It's pretty, it's pretty interesting. Um, but where I grew up, it's not the same as it is in the US in terms of identity where everybody wants to be Indian, where people are saying, um, um, 118th Cherokee, I'm 132nd Cherokee. It's kind, of a, it's kind of a joke among Native American people when they go to a, a, a powwow and they see a bunch of blonde haired, blue eyed guys and they say, oh, there come the Cherokees, you know. It's not like that in Mexico. Uh, you know, no offense to Elizabeth Warren or anything like that. You know, some people may have that blood, some people may not, you know, but the thing is, it's a different approach in a lot of Latin America because to be Indio, to be native is considered shameful and, and we were always told that. No somos indios, that means we're not Indian. But it, it really meant something else. To be indio is like a derogatory word. It's like, it's like the N-word, it means savage. So that part of our heritage was pretty strongly denied, but you know, we, and, and most of my family, they didn't question that. A couple of us were looking at some of our uncles and like, are you sure? I mean, this guy's really dark, can't grow a must. This guy, my uncle, my uncle Louie, my uncle so-and-so, he really looks Indian. And we started looking at some of the pictures. Here's one of my grandmas. Her name's Augustina. I mean, you look at her, she's obviously Indian, right? This is fresh out of a Time Life Western Old West series book here. But she was very Catholic, didn't speak her native tongue. Uh, most people in her family get, were given uh, Christian names, and that part of the heritage was just erased. How is that? We're going to talk about how that happens. I always knew that wasn't true. The pictures speak for themselves, and now there's such a thing as 23 and Me, which I did, and it's like, yeah, no, that, that, was not, that was not at all accurate, you know. So how did that happen? Well, I found this on Facebook. Anytime you have a, a conquest, the victors get to write the history. The victors get to decide what religion reigns. The, vit the victors get to decide what part of the heritage is shameful and which part is prideful. And this couldn't be more true. The conquest of the Americas was, was, was brutal. There was rape, there was plunder, there, was, there, were, there were atrocities committed, all in the name of Christ. You know, it's not just me, because if you look at our history, 
So much of history is built on conquest, and for a large swath of our history, it was all religious conquest. So everybody probably has this in their heritage. Now this is, if you go to El Paso and come out of the El Paso International Airport, you'll see this statue. It's the largest equestrian statue in the world. It's massive. You can't tell by looking at it, but you know, a person is about the size of this person's, of this statue's head. Um, this, this statue represents Juan de Oñate. He was a Spanish conqueror that passed through what is now known as El Paso in the 1500s. And as it turns out, we trace the other side of our family to this guy's, mis this guy's, uh, this guy's mission. Not him directly, but people who were on his ship. Um, he's memorialized in this way. Um, but when you know the history, and I write about this person in my book, when you know the history of this guy, he was really kind of a sociopathic killer. He committed many, many atrocities where he wiped out indigenous village after indigenous village. And one of the things that, that he, um, one of the things that he kind of branded him, his, himself into historical infamy for was going into the pueblos at, in Acoma, what's now Acoma, New Mexico, and rounded up all the men, all the fighting age men, and chopped off one of their feet, hobbled them. And you can guess what he did with the women. Yet, the Spanish rewrote the history for the region, so he was memorialized here. A lot of my, uh, my native friends who lived there protested this over and over and over, and finally they changed his name to the Equestrian instead of Juan de Oñate, but everybody knew who this was. Interestingly, they, they, somebody, they erected a statue, a much, much smaller version in Akuma. That's right. So, so what happened was some native men snuck in in the middle of the night and took a t cutting torch and chopped off one of his feet, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, what, what did he cut, off one of cut off one of his feet. Cut off one of the statue's feet. So, so um, the interesting thing and relevant to today's talk is, you know, how how the Spanish completed this conquest. Leveling the religious altars of the people, the resident people who of in the Americas was really it had it had primacy in the conquest. Literally, you know, altars were were toppled, and from the ruins, cathedrals were built. And the Spanish, in effect, told the native inhabitants, like, you know, and you know, this is the new god. He's he's the dominant male god. He's more powerful than your gods. You kneel before him, but. Since I have this special relationship with him, the special alliance with him, you kneel before me too because I represent him. Send us your gold, send us your ore, send us everything you got, including your women. That was the arrangement. So, you know, that brings, coming back to, to us making sense of all this, because God concepts are central to the world's religions, and because men such as Juan de Oñate and so many others often cite gods as inspiration for religious violence, when we start to try and understand where this all comes from, we can start to understand it by examining the nature of gods. So my book Alpha God and, and today's talk use evolutionary biology and psychology to understand how the dominant male god of the Abrahamic faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, uh, uh, and how our, our human projections result in religious violence. So there are many things, there are many, many fields which offer proximate explanations for this. But what I love about the evolutionary sciences is that they're able to illuminate the ultimate reasons for any kind of human psychology, the why, the, the stated purpose of our fears, of our inclinations, of our loves, of our dislikes, and increasingly our religious beliefs. So from here we start with several critical contradictions in the, in, in the manner in which the Abrahamic God is described. So this God is described through all the omnis, omniscience, right, being all powerful, or omnipotent rather, being all powerful, omniscient, knowing everything, immaterial, not having a bodily form like you and me, and everlasting never dying. But why then, why is this God so preoccupied with territory? 
Organic beings like us require territory to extract resources necessary for survival and reproduction. An omnipotent being shouldn't require these resources. But he defends his holy lands with terrible violence, nevertheless. Why would an all-powerful God be so preoccupied with submission displays? Mortal beings in dominance positions require submission displays because, and they require that reassurance because they can be toppled. But an all, all powerful being should have no credible threats to its position on the hierarchy. But this God demands regular submission displays from its subordinates. And if he doesn't receive them, he enacts terrible violence, according to scripture. Why be so preoccupied with the sexual behaviors of his subordinates? An all-powerful being doesn't need to reproduce, doesn't need to compete for reproductive resources like mortals, yet he shows immense sexual jealousy and spends a great deal of energy trying to police the sex lives of his subordinates and what happens to those who are unfaithful to him? Violence. For that matter, why is God male? What, what would an everlasting being need reproductive organs for? Doesn't need to reproduce himself into the future. So the answer, as you may have maybe deduced by now, is this, this dominant male God was created by dominant men and is based on a dominant male human. And men are biological creatures for whom territory, dominance, and sexual primacy are all related to their genetic fitness. And the strivings of men were inherited from our primate ancestry. Now, anytime you, you, you learn or study or think about you know, the evolutionary sciences, it's important to not make what is called the, the commit the naturalistic fallacy. And that means just by just because something may be arrived at through genetic means, such as male violence does not mean that it's moral, does not mean that, that, it's, that it's desired, or that it's inevitable. Um, another point that we often talk about is that most of our psychology, psychology is driven by forces outside of our conscious awareness. What eminent evolutionary psychologists Lita Cosmides and John Tooby out of University of California, Santa Barbara, call mind uh, instinct blindness. We're, we're blind to our instincts, and the older they are, the usually the more blind we are to them. We don't have to think about breathing. We don't have to think about our heart beating. It's, it's unconscious, you know. Um, finally, it's important to remind ourselves that gods don't commit violence and oppression. Men do. And they, have, they, have, they cite their gods as, as, as reasons for that. And men create gods that specifically serve male reproductive interests. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So a couple manifestations of this God, this, this alpha male God paradigm that we're going to talk about today are dominance and submission displays as they occur across apes, humans, and male gods. And mating strategies as they occur across apes, humans, and male gods. Um, so let us start with some simple comparative zoology. This fascinating creature is called the, the skin flap lizard. I forget what his actual name was, but he has these amazing skin flaps that, that flare out to make his head look bigger. And he uses these for intimidation displays. And if you're designing an animal, you would want uh, intimidation dis display to be on his head because there's attentional bias to the head because that's where the eyes of intention are, that's where the mouth is, that's where that's where a lot of attention needs to be placed. As you can see, it's feigning larger size. It flares out, it makes his head look bigger. And he uses this to deter predators. We see this adaptation in mammals as well. Here's the male lion. Look at that magnificent mane. Notably absent in female lions. Now, there's been research found that, finding that um, Male lions who've won more competitions with other males have fuller manes. It's meant to, to intimidate rivals in battle. We also see this adaptation in primates. Up here on the right, we have the, the Brazza monkey with 
a big hair tuft right here, giant eyebrows, and a beard. It's concentrated in males. Here we have the, the, the white-eared marmoset, big furry ear tufts, concentrated in males. Here we have the gelata baboon, and this guy, you see this really concentrated in the male orang, the big orange beard, these giant fatty cheek pads, and a large uh, zygomatic bone, the bone that, 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 that the cheeks are, uh, that comprise the cheeks. So notably, these adaptations, these appurtenances are absent in females or adolescent males. They're used to intimidate rivals in competition for mates. Humans also have this adaptation and most people don't even realize that. This is really the purpose of beards. Not surprisingly, we see this adaptation concentrated among fighting men or men who are want to advertise themselves as badasses in some way. No surprise, the same hormone in that, that's responsible for beard growth is also responsible for muscle mass, is also responsible for sexual and aggressive behaviors. So that's much of what we'd expect if beards had a role in male mate competition. Perhaps not surprisingly, we see this adaptation and men of religious orders, men who are high on the religious hierarchy. Here, I think we have a Hasidic rabbi. Here, some, I think he's a Russian Orthodox, I want to say. Could be wrong. Anybody recognize this guy? Who's that? Ayatollah Khomeini. Now, Scripture has a lot to say about beards that make this link for us. This is from Leviticus. You shall not round off the side growth of your heads nor harm the edges of your beards. It's forbidding that. Here is St. Augustine had an enormous influence on, on Christianity and Western thinking. The beard signifies the courageous. St. Clement of Alexandria, the beard lent the face dignity and paternal terror. God adorned man like lions with a beard, a sign of strength and rule. Interestingly, there was in, in, in Amish country, there was a, a, a widely publicized incident where, where Amish men were fighting each other and to show, each, to show dominance, they, would, they attacked each other and shaved off each other's beards. With this idea of making the head look bigger and more fearsome, does anybody notice anything else about these men? Big hats, right? So, so human beings have the ability to create technology to accomplish what they want to accomplish and to do so in a way that resonates with our primate psychology. They're wearing big hats. Interestingly, we also see this concentrated in fighting men. On the left, you have a Lakota warrior wearing a buffalo headdress with, the, with, with eagle feathers on it, which they wore into battle specifically to intimidate rivals. In the middle, you have General George Washington. And on the right, you have a Russian general with this giant hat on his head. In military hierarchy, just as in church hierarchy, those who have, those who are higher on the hi hierarchy have bigger hats than their subordinates. You don't see privates wearing hats like this in the military. It's meant to connote dominance. That's pretty intuitive when you think about it, right? What do you make of this guy? It's not intended to be subtle, right? This is the queen's guard. This, his job is tied into male mate competition, I would say. You know, one of the things that, that I cite a lot in, in, in Alpha God and in my upcoming book, which I'll talk to you guys about later, is, that, is a quote by William James. He said, in order to understand our evolved psychology, we must make the natural seem strange. We must distance ourselves from, from, from you know, ideas that we have that are so commonplace that we take it for granted. So when you say this out loud, this is a, this is a, a male guarding a high-status female with violence. And what does he have on his head? A giant head display made not of felt, not of straw, not of metal, but from the skin of a fearsome predator. This has resonance to us as primates. You don't look at this guy and say, I want to mess with this guy. You don't look at this guy and say, I want to mess with the queen, do you? This is the Pope and his triple-crowned tiara encrusted with jewels sparkling with gold. And for us modern humans, wealth signifies power. 
If you ever read the history of the popes, it's stunning how much, how, you know, they, they were, they did some amazing things. They commanded armies. They commanded a papal, papal armies. They invaded neighboring city-states, conquered them, took their resources. Um, they killed, some popes would kill other popes to assume the papacy. This is all in the history of the popes. One pope actually had a literal brothel in the, pipe, in the papal palace, a literal brothel. Much as we would expect from male primates who assume power. Every time they, they, they crown the pope, this, the, the, the pronouncement, there's a papal dictate that reads, Receive the tiara adorned with three crowns, and know thou art the father of princes and kings, ruler of the world and vicar of our Savior Jesus Christ on earth, to whom is honor and glory in the ages of ages. This is a pronouncement of total power. And there was a papal dictate that actually allowed popes to make princes kiss their feet and to depose emperors. When we have somebody with this much power, you know, they capitalize on this male primate, primate dominance display. It has resonance for us. Lastly, check out this guy. How many people here think he's trying to be subtle? He's got the giant head display, he's got the beard, and he's carrying a sword. You know, this is seriously ancient primate psychology happening here. And so, when you say it out loud, it seems pretty obvious. That's what a lot of people have said about my books. Like, oh my gosh, now that I see it, it's so freaking obvious. It's right under our nose, making the natural seem strange. Okay, so. What is that religion? Sikhism. Yeah. Yeah. So we've seen how males show dominance. And now I want to talk to you about how, how primates show submission. In the material world, size matters. Big fish eats little fish, right? Big chimpanzee bests little chimpanzee. So across the primate world, across many animal species, even ants. How animals show submission to more dominant individuals is they shrink down. They shrink down to show smaller size. In the material world, this makes sense, right? It shows, I show no threat. I'm smaller than you. You're bigger than me. Here's an example of a chimpanzee showing a submission display to an alpha. So, we see if, 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 if this hypothesis is right, then we should expect these behaviors to be, you know, pronounced in religion, in our religious worship of God. If we use our mental hardware to understand, you know, the ether, so to speak, if we project, if in the clouds, the faces we see in the clouds, you know, what, what do we see in those faces? We see dominance as we know it through our primate brains. Right. Caesar Milan, the, the dog whisperer, he capitalized on this idea with, you know, with, with his product by saying, you have to become, you have to become the, the, uh, the pack leader. Right, thank you, the pack leader. Because dogs have hardware already designed to recognize dominant individuals. In fact, you know, zoologists talk about why we were able to, to um, domesticate certain animals and, and, and not other animals, horses and not zebras, because horses have a, a clear dominance st structure. So in the horse brain, there are literally apparatuses designed to recognize the dominance hierarchy. And when you train a horse, that's what you do. You become, you become the herd leader. So we see these same submission displays in religion. Here's how it manifests in Islam. Can anybody deny the similarity of this? <laughs> and not surprisingly, Islam translates to the word submission. In the Catholic Church, you see this as well. You kneel before the altar. You kneel, there's, there's uh, furniture <laughs> with, with little platforms specifically designed to kneel behind every pew, behind every pew. When you greet the Pope, or you know the bishop or whatever you kneel you show smaller size and you kneel when you're when you're addressing God when you're praying to God
let me just point out that size should be irrelevant to an immaterial being who doesn't have a physical form. We make the displays based on what we know. Here's a, a, a dominant individual submitting a, a weaker or a lesser um, chimpanzee. Here's how we do it in, in, you know, with, in front of royalty. Here's another one. Another appeasement gesture that ethnologists have, have, have discovered is kissing. In the primate world, making smacking noises, kissing, kissing noises. We see this in chimpanzees, we see this in other primates, and in shows of submission. So the idea is that it, it emulates infant suckling noises. When infants suckle, they make that sound, the kissing noise. And so when you want to show a submission to a dominant individual, you make that sound to connote infanthood. I'm a child. I'm an infant. I'm helpless. Don't attack me. Oh, this is how we bow before God in the same way. Here's how we see this behavior in, in chimpanzees. Is there any question here? Which one of these is the dominant individual and which one of these is the submissive? <laughs> that is so like kissing the wing. Funny you should say that. Just look at this. Is there any question? Listen, we're primates. This is an example of this. Is there any question which one of these is the dominant one? Okay, so with that established, what I'd, what I'd, what I'd like to talk about, because it's relevant to, to, to how this translates, not only to submission displays, but to religious violence, is reproduction, reproductive strategies. So, generally speaking, there's a huge international body of, of, of research finding that in general, in general, men and women enact different reproductive strategies. We see this across political systems, we see this across socioeconomic status, religion, culture, where females invest more in their offspring, so they're generally choosier. Men overwhelmingly perform more sexual partners compared to women. Now this is not to say that, that, that you know, women shouldn't prefer multiple partners, or that they can't, or that they don't. Personally, I feel women and men should be able to do whatever is consensual, be able to do whatever you want, I don't care. Um, but evolutionary fitness in men is related to number of copulations, wherein in females, it's just, that's, just not, that's just not the same. So research finds that men strongly prefer casual sex more, masturbate more, fantasize about group sex more than women, there's so much research to back this up. A set of studies had attractive undergraduates who were Confederates, researchers posing as non-researchers, approach the opposite sex on campus and quickly offer casual sex. Across all these studies, a whopping 75% of men said, hell yeah, let's go. Guess how many, across these studies, how many, what percentage of the women Zero. So that, that brings us to this, and we have to explain this. Now I want to try and show you a video just to illustrate how... Pretty awesome, huh? Now, how many men in the room saw this? No, don't answer that. So listen, um, marketing executives have no problem with evolutionary psychology. They get it. And is there any question what is meant by spray more, get more? This is marketed towards this, this male tendency. So there is a strong demand for women. The thing is, there's, to use some terms from economics, there's a notable scarcity. Female reproductive resources are vastly limited compared to males, to the span between adoles adolescence and menopause, limited by pregnancy, limited in societies that practice polygyny. 
by so many other factors. Divorced men remarry more than divorced women, and they tend to remarry younger. So what happens is they trade in for more fertile females. So in the end, what happens is that males across many species compete for females, often violently, and, and men are no exception. One example of this is uh, you know, these large global studies looking at you know, 40, 50, 60 countries find that, that in societies where there is more polygyny, there's more revolutions. So when women are restricted, men take up arms a lot more easily, especially young men. So two strategies that we want to talk about today to understand this uh, are, are in, in, in male mate competition are acquiring mates and restricting mates. These are patterns that we see across primate species and including, including humans. So baboons will acquire mates by chasing rival males and stealing their females through a process known as herding. And that's how they, they grow their harem. That's what it's called among primatologists, harem. Um, chimpanzees, they will form these all-male war parties. And if you've ever seen these videos, they're stunning to watch because they look distinctly human. They form these all-male war parties and, and, and have a cadence to, reserved exclusively for war. Single file, they patrol through the jungle. Watch that and then watch footage of men patrolling in, the, in Vietnam during the Vietnam War. It's stunning. So what they do is, is they, they, they patrol the boundary of their territory and if they find any lone males or, or lesser numbers of males, they attack. And the attacks are brutal. Biting, kicking, punching, biting off genitalia. So the idea is to kill any, any lone males or if they have numerical supremacy, kill the males. Women, or, or the females I should say, they're, they're, they're typically spared that kind of violence. So what happens over and over is that eventually a chimpanzee troop who engages in this and is successful at it will absorb the rival chimpanzee troop's territory, all the resources within that territory, and that rival troop's females. So the, male, the fitness of the males living in that troop increases by engaging in this warfare. But is there a, a reproductive motivation for warfare in humans? First, it is fought by male primates. And interestingly, aggression in males has a high correlation to sexual peak. This is known as young male and aggression syndrome. So if you, if you graph out men's sexual peak years and their sexual violent years, they, they graph it perfectly onto one another. Um, does that mean when men go to war they're con consciously thinking about acquiring the mates? No, it, it doesn't mean that. But the, the statistics I want to show you are quite revealing. Bosnian genocide, 50,000. Rwandan genocide. Can you guess what they stand for? Anybody know? I was going to let you guess. I was going to guess rapes. Wartime rapes. Wartime rapes. The ease with which men will rape in warfare is stunning. Just the Red Army in Berlin during World War II, it's estimated two million women were raped. And it only doesn't happen when it's strictly prohibited and vigorously re uh, enforced. If our religions are based on male domination and male mate competition, we would expect to see similar patterns and even a casual read of the Bible will show you this. This is, this is Moses commanding his men to, to, to rape ostensibly at the command of his dominant male god. In Numbers it says, Now kill all the boys and kill every woman who has slept with a man, but save for yourself every girl who has never slept with a man. This stuff goes on and on and on and on in the Old Testament. Here's another one in Deuteronomy where God instructs the, the Israelites, When you go to war against your enemies and the Lord your God, the male alliance in warfare, delivers them into your hands and you, take ca and you take captives. If you notice among the captives a beautiful woman and are attracted to her, you may take her to your wife. Now suffice it to say that you know, when, when women see their entire family slaughtered in front of them, not willingly go with their, with, with their, their family's uh, murderers. There are some exceptions which are based on evolutionary psychology but beyond the scope of this conversation. But this is 
so prevalent in the Bible. The biblical age was a terrible time to grow up. We also see this in contemporary affairs. ISIS, Boko Haram. When ISIS tore into northern Iraq, what did they do? They slaughtered all the women and took the Yazidi, they slaughtered all the men, took the Yazidi women as sexual slaves. Boko Haram did something similar in Nigeria. Driven by the instructions of their male god. There's another strategy in the repertoire of, of uh, mate competition among primates, and that is restriction. For, for males, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, a very profound evolutionary fear, and that is the fear of cuckoldry. Has anybody ever heard of that? A cuckold. Do you know where that comes from? The cuckoo bird. So the cuckoo bird engages in this practice known as brood parasitism. So what it does, its strategy is it goes into other species' nests, lay their eggs in there, and suckers those birds into raising their young. So this is a big danger to be cuckolded for males because all the energy expenditure, all the risks that you take um, to rear an offspring that doesn't bear your, GN your DNA. Now, this, this is, has been a historical fear for, for, for men as well because before the advent of contraception, you had no idea whether or not your child was yours. And one of the ways to ensure that your genes get into the gene pool and not your rivals is to have a virgin bride. Those men of power who had it within their means to do so could demand that because virgin brides come guaranteed to not be carrying your rival's genes. Saint Joseph was a cockle. Pardon? Saint Joseph was a cockle. Maybe Saint Joseph was a cockle. You know, I've heard that argument before. <laughs> So it's interesting, though, that we have across religious traditions this notion that God prefers virgins. Okay. <laughs> God prefers virgins. The Inca, the, the Inca sun gods have had virgins dedicated to them, for example. The fathers of Jesus and Krishna of Hinduism preferred virgins. And this idea of, of, of virginity and chastity, you see it across, across religious traditions. You know, um, in, in, in the book of Jacob, for I, the Lord God, delight in the chastity of women, and whoredoms are an abomination before me. Paul, according to Paul, Christ demands virgins. For I have espoused to you one husband that may, may, I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. The body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the, and, and the Lord for the body. But the thing is, an omniscient God would know if a child is already his. And, and, and an omnipotent God wouldn't really care, right? So clearly, human males have written scripture to serve their own reproductive interests. So I, I thought I had a, a quote here, but uh, wives, submit yourself unto your husbands as is fit the Lord. <laughs> so um, another, another um, restriction strategy is punishing straying females. We see this across primate species. Punishing females for straying, for fl flirting with other males, being in another male's vicinity, um, grooming other males. Male non-human primates do this. It's called mate guarding. So we've seen, uh, you know, males biting, dragging, hitting females who stray too close to other males. In human primates, spousal abuse is vastly disproportionately committed by men against women, and sexual jealousy is usually the primary motivator. So this is an example of punishing females that Jane Goodall noticed in her studies of the chimpanzees at Gombe. Fegan was one of the chimpanzees she noticed. He would race towards the pair and often bash the female for her faithlessness. Here's a quote from Deuteronomy. If a man happens to meet in town a virgin pledged to be married and, and he sleeps with her, you shall take them both to the gate and stone them to death, the young woman because she was in a town and did not scream for help. The woman gets punished for this. Now, it's interesting that in the book of Revelation, is anybody familiar with this book? <laughs> Dark, 
gory, brutal. God rains down a terrible fury upon the earth. He floods the earth, the, the cities of blood. He kills everything, living thing in the sea by turning the sea into blood. It goes on and on and on and on in gory detail. Does anybody know why he did that? All this rage was because his, his two wives, which persona, were personified in the cities of Samaria and Jerusalem, were unfaithful to him. And this was, this was punishment for their faithlessness. So, part of this, let me read you part of this. Um, Oh, I think there's another one. This was from Exodus. So, so God is described as being a sexually jealous God. I'll read this to you because it's very striking. It's very dark. For thou shalt worship no other God for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land. And they go whoring around other gods. Anyway, whoring and whoring and whoring. It goes on with the whoring. You get it. It's a sexual jealousy. Here's another passage. And I will direct my jealousy against thou, that they may deal with you in fury. They shall cut off your nose and your ears, and your survivors shall fall by the sword. They shall seize your sons and your daughters, and your survivors shall be devoured by fire. I I'll spare you all the details. It goes on and on and on and on. But what happens when the barrier of, between church and state is compromised? When male reproductive strategy has unfettered privilege and seeps into our judicial system, into our culture, into our values. Well, all this talk of cutting off noses and ears becomes a reality. This was the cover of Time Magazine. The, the young woman there, Bibi Aisha, was a girl who ran away from an arranged marriage to an, to an abusive husband. And this is what he did to her, with the help of her father, her father-in-law, I should say and three other male relatives. What can we do about this? Well, bottom line, we must maintain that wall between church and state. Allowing even the slightest breach is a terrible mistake. And daily there are attempts to breach that wall. And I live in Texas where that has really become a reality where the Texas State Board of Education is trying to teach creationism in schools and try to downplay the relevance of evolutionary science. Even thinkers like uh, Thomas Jefferson for their anti-religious sentiment are getting cut from textbooks. We should absolutely ensure that evolutionary science has a protected place in the conversation about who we are. Because without this knowledge, we are far, far, far more vulnerable to simply enacting our worst impulses without understanding them. But with this knowledge, we can identify the alleged preferences of a dominant male God for what they really are. And maybe then we can decide whether we wish to give the most brutal aspects of our evolved psychology, religious, or judicial privilege, or whether we should leave them in our ancestral past where they belong. Thank you. Now that everybody's depressed, <laughs> guess I can open up some time for questions. Uh, I miss uh, what well, you, you made a reference to a, uh, polygamy and revolution. I didn't get that. In societies where there are revolution, where there are where is, where polygyny is is allowed, there's a there's a greater frequency of revolutions. So what? Who fights revolutions? Young men fight revolutions, and there's this idea known as embodied capital. Young men, just like any other kind of, of, of male primate, you know, usually don't have the status of more established males. So typically, the idea is to, to break into that dominance hierarchy, it takes a lot of aggression. That's why you see a lot more risk taking in young males as opposed to older males. And, you know, older men don't fight revolutions, it's young men. You know, young men are the ones who go to war. So you see a higher prevalence of that. David. Uh, first of all, I'm going to shave my beard. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, that's a short beard. All right. 
but here's my question, and this, uh, as I was looking at the pictures of the Pope, now, so you've got a really big hat, right, which is supposed to be about dominance, about sexual dominance, but males in the Catholic hierarchy, especially if you're a priest, you're not supposed to have sex. Yeah. What is the dichotomy of having the display, if it, if it's for evolutionary purposes to be the alpha, but then to not send your seed forward? Well, that's a great question. And, you know, how I write about it, first of all, it's complicated because throughout the history of, of religion, um, men of the religious order did, in fact, have sex. And, and you know, one of, the, one of the, the historical lines that I write about is the Franciscans, uh, missionaries in, in Mexico and California and New Mexico, they were notorious womanizers. They had children with all the Indian women of the villages that they were seen to oversee their flock. You know, the popes were notorious womanizers. You know, but I, I think probably, you know, this, this idea of chastity, you know, in the primate hierarchy, dominant males, they have reproductive primacy. So their male subordinates have to cut that off as well. There's even a history of, 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 of people castrating themselves in the service of God. The Russian people, the Skopsky people would do that, castrate themselves and across other religions. So I think it probably has to do with that. It probably has to do with, look, you're, you're going to subserve my sexual interest as, a, as, a, as a, a virile, dominant male who's really interested in whether or not you have sex. So men of religious, and there are other practical reasons. This is just the psychology uh, that I think it rests on. David, and, and then, and then. Point of view. Uh, there is always going to be a percentage of any species that doesn't reproduce. Yeah. So if everybody became celibate, that would be the end of the species. Yeah. But if these people are self-selecting themselves out, it doesn't affect the holistic because the other eight billion of us are involved in this. Yeah. Drive. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a big trend in the Bible. You know, in, in Christianity, what you see more is men and women both reserving themselves sexually for God. You know, there's this, notion, there's this idea of the, the bride of Christ where both men and women have female souls to subserve God's sexual interests. And I, Evangelicals. I, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I think getting back to the question that was first asked about uh, why uh, religions, for instance, uh, uh, promote uh, chastity and so on, uh, you have to keep in mind that these evolutionary factors that you've been referring to go way, way back, long before religion ever even came into existence in any sense or form. Yeah. Uh, and so these various uh, evolutionary characteristics that you've been describing, uh, religion is something that came long, long after those attributes got uh, ingrained in our chromosomes mm -hmm. yeah yeah and sometimes it, it, it just manifests in such a way that you know my god says i can have a thousand women and and other times like no i'm supposed to i'm supposed to sacrifice my sexuality for this dominant being which is very intuitive primate behavior because that's what happens in the dominance hierarchy and and a lot of times a lot of times in in skirmishes between competing primates genitalia is bitten off you know, so that's a, literally a way to eliminate your sexual competitor. Yes, and then I'll get to you, yes. I want to ask you this because I'm sure you've thought about it. What's going on with bonobos? Uh, yeah. Because uh, female bonobos you know, are dominant too, right? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Bonobos are a noted exception. And, and um, I've got a new book coming out in February called Sex, Power, and Partisanship, where it really kind of links bonobos to, you know, this kind of more liberal, feminine-oriented mate and eat freely with one another, compassion, whereas conservatism is like the robust chimpanzee, you know, warlike, territorial, xenophobic, male-run um, group of, of, you know, male coalitions designed for war. But I, I think it was Franz de Waal, I can't remember, I, I, I could be wrong about that. Some primatologist I read said, you know, 
at our worst, we're like bonobos, and I mean, at our best, we're like bonobos, and at our worst, we're like the robust chimpanzee. You know, but even then, there are dominant structure hierarchies within bonobos. So more dominant male bonobos have more frequent copulations than less dominant. It's just less pronounced, and a lot of that has to do with where they are, in where they, the the Zaire River cuts bonobo and and uh, robust chimpanzee territory in half. And robust chimpanzees have to, have to compete with, um, they have to compete with gorillas. And so they've developed this warlike way to, to cope with that sort of evolutionary pressure. So, um, uh, so the food supply is way more abundant among, among uh, bonobos, so they can kind of be kindlier in that sense, because they don't have to compete so viciously. But you know, I could go on and on about that. But you got a question? Good question? Well, I thought even being uh, polytheistic, uh, you still have this veil. Like, yeah. Being yeah. Kind of sure. Sure. And I've seen um, different programs on National Geographic where they even had people like in from the jungles of South America or, or Southeast Asia. And it seems like all the women are worried about it seem to be concerned about is that they don't, they have a husband who won't eat. Yeah, yeah. It seems like it's, you know, that really kind of spread all over the planet. Well, to, to comment on, to, on, your, on your first point, yeah, even, even polytheistic religions usually have a dominance hierarchy and there's usually a dominant male yeah. acting like a dominant male human, which, you know, we are one species of great apes who so was acting like a dominant male primate, you know. I mean, Zeus was a notorious womanizer and he, he, he competed with other humans and, and other gods with his thunderbolts and, you know, raped women and stuff like that. So, yeah, you do see that. Yeah. And he was, uh, Zeus was a wife beater. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. It's a clarification question. You're not suggesting that religion burned violence, but you are saying that it gave us a more focused way to use our violence? It's a terrific question. Look, we are, we are tribalistic. We are a tribalistic species. And we would form groups and demonize the outside group without religion. We do it with sports teams. We do it with city, on, you know, what side of the... the the tracks you're born, you're born in. We do it, you know, in, in secular societies as well. You know, so you see this, this pattern of dominance, of sexual control, of demonizing the outsider without religion. But the problem with religion is it sacralizes it. And it gives people a sense of ecstasy when committing religious violence. You know, one of the things I write about in the book is just if you've ever had the misfortune of seeing those alcohol Gaeta snuff videos where they behead people and the screams, of, you know, Allah al Akbar, you know, it's like it's palpable how there's this scent, there's this high that people get off of that because it's infused with religious ecstasy. And, you know, religions sacralize things in such a way that they, you can't, they can't be questioned because it's heresy. But as I write about, that's also embedded in the dominance hierarchy because you, you know, if you're a lesser ape, you don't question the dominance hierarchy. You don't question the dominant ape's position unless you want to fight. You know, um, not questioning has worked our way in, into our morals and our religious practices as well, and, and notions such as, as heresy or papal infallibility. Anything that the Pope says is infallible cannot be questioned. People have been executed for that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, sure. When when you go to war, for example, you are just flooded with so many chemicals, adrenaline, and even oxytocin. When it comes to relating to your brothers in arms, there's a lot of research looking into this now. Serotonin, you get a serotonin. So fighters get a serotonin boost when they win a fight, and a testosterone boost. That feels good, you know, and 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 when you lose a fight or even a tennis match or even a chess match you get a drop in testosterone and serotonin so yeah there there are there are there are neurochemical correlates to all of this stuff hi oh, this is more of a complicated question i don't mean to downplay your perspective but sort of my perspective would be that 
Um, you mentioned Christopher Columbus earlier, and I believe so, in like the New World and sort of the conquering and like, raping and pillaging and killing of people, innocent people over, you know, the belief of being dominant over them, having a superior way of life and sort of using God and the Catholic religion to, um, I guess, have permission to complete those tasks. I would personally argue that I feel religion is, a, in my personal opinion, a major excuse to kill and to dominate over right. others. Um, like you brought up all these points, especially about women versus men. I mean, the whole basis, and I would argue starting point of modern day society of, you know, the women being the caretakers and the like sort of submission comes from the Bible. And um, also as being raised in a society as a young woman, I am taught, and especially I was raised in a Southern atmosphere where religion and the Christian religion is sort of dominant, that you are to be the submissive to your husband and you are to serve your husband and husbands look at it as like a prideful thing to take care of you. And I think that that goes hand in hand with sort of the killing mentality. Um, we believe that, you know, by killing in the name of God, we could serve a greater purpose. Yeah. And I would also argue that's not just Christianity. That's like you said, a lot of the alpha religions, I would say, yeah. Islam, Judaism, Christianity, it, it creates a purpose for violence. It creates yeah. a reasoning. It, it allows us to have an excuse to be angry and to hurt people. Yeah. It certainly seems to grease the wheels. And, and something you said that kind of struck me too is like, yeah, I mean, clearly women didn't write biblical scripture. And, <laughs> and, and you know, the, the cradle of civilization where, where, you know, biblical scripture originated was not the cradle of gender equality, that's for sure. Um, it, it very obviously serves male reproductive interests. Uh, I certainly do prefer uh, things like uh, ethics and uh, better angels, but uh, I, th I think it needs a reason, uh, the way that you've given a reason to uh, brutishness. You know, for reason for that's existing. Uh, I mean, I don't have anything more than really uh, my own self-interest and the self-interest of my family, but it doesn't really seem to be uh, linked up with those more fundamental claims of be of goodness. Have you thought about that? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Maybe if I. I if I understand what you're saying correctly, well, I, you know, I should say this. Um, you mentioned the better angels of our of our nature, you know, and I think you were referring. To, are you referring to Stephen Pinker's book? Well, the phrase. I'm not the phrase. referring to his book. Refer, you know, he he took he took the phrase from right. some, some Right. Right. Well, I mean, all this focus on on the, on the negative does not mean that that's who we are. We're we're we're, we're also we also can are capable of great compassion. We're also great, capable of great charity and, and, and understanding and, and of, of, of building civilizations in addition to tearing them down, of, 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 of crossing boundaries, of crossing, you know, building bridges too. So, you know, when we focus on this, it's not to, it's not to get into too dark a place about who we are, but we do need to focus on it. So this book, Better Angels of Our Nature, is just compiling this massive amount of data from when we were hunter-gatherers, looking at archaeological records to looking at homicide rates across the world, and is finding that we are actually getting more peaceable as a species from when we were hunter-gatherers. And, and you know, secularism and enlightenment thinking is, is driving a lot of that. The most peaceable societies, the most peaceable societies that measurably on every possible measure of societal health you can look at. Teen pregnancy, GDP, um, uh, charity for the poor, health care, things like that, also happen to be the least religious, mostly in Scandinavia. So it's interesting. But, but they got a couple other questions. I could, you're going to have to stop me. I can geek out all day long. Uh, given your comment on uh, 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 do you consider Trumpism a religion? Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I did a piece on that in Psychology Today, where it all comes from. I mean, you know, uh, and, it, and, and it's, a, it's a very, that phenomenon is a very prominent topic of my upcoming book, you know, but, but, but you know, 
God promises protection from death itself. There's scripture in the Bible saying that Jesus offers protection from, or, 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 or Yahweh, I forget which one, from, from literal, literal predators on the African savanna. Wild dogs, lions, oxen, you know, all these predators, you know, um, um, protects our, our borders from the neighboring tribes. Well, that's, that's, that's what, that's Trump's mantra too. He just preys on the fears of, of the populace saying, you know, I'm going to protect you from the Mexican rapists coming up to take our jobs and our money and all this kind of stuff. So preying on those fears. And one thing that's really interesting when you study, I could, don't want to go off too far on this topic, but when you study our political psychology, conservatives tend to be way more fear-oriented. All kinds of, of stimuli, imputing aggression into neutral faces. Can, people who score high on, on various measures of political conservatism are more likely to, do, to, to, to project aggression, to show more fear with regard to like, you know, pictures of spiders and things like that. Even have a larger amygdala, amygdala, the part of the brain that's in charge of the, the fear and aggression response. So there have been, there've been imaging studies looking at that. So the stunning thing is, you know, if it, and, and you know, so what I what I always try to convey every time I get a chance to is that if we don't understand our evolved psychology, others who understand it better than us are going to use it to manipulate us. Let me tell you, all these political operators behind every political campaign, you see, they understand this stuff. They understand it well. Yes. I think the things that bring all of our comments and our questions together um, revolve around the biology and the physiology of uh, what makes up our brain and the way in which it works mechanistically. And um, the reason that we see these things is because um, it's been proven that the male brain um, is of needing that dominance. Um, and having a more of what we would define as an ego and those behaviors that are associated with it. But our brain is designed to only focus mainly, I shouldn't say only, but to um, be mainly uh, prioritized on the negative things. Um, we're not designed to hold more joy and positive memories as we are the negative. And if we question those things amongst us tonight and say, why, how is she making sense there? We can kind of look at the things that, you know, Dr. Garcia just spoke with us tonight about, about fear, right? So we are able to stay alive because of fear and our brain therefore keeps us alive to prevent us encountering these fears. And so what is happening in the Trump movement and in movements prior um, to Trump where fear has been used as a tactic um, to dominate a group of people, they're using this mechanism that neuroscientists have discovered, you know, yeah. years ago. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's it's just directly prodding fear. I think we got one more question and then I've got books to sell and sign and stuff like that. My last question. Yeah. How much is the book? Twenty bucks. <laughs> Cheap. Cheap. So, I'll be right here if you want to buy some. Thank you. Thank you. I think I will sit down because... Yeah, good.